issue on the African scene, the politics of succession in Africa, the crisis of stability and power. How, how critical is this? Police arrested for 12 people for the violence in Johannesburg, while eight others were arrested. On today's edition of the program, we take a look at the just concluded 33rd Ordinary Session of the African Union Summit, which took place in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with the theme, Silencing the Guns. Now, with unending conflict fueling poverty, can Africa's leaders find answers to the elusive peace and prosperity on a continent that holds so much promise? My name is Henry Williams, your host. Join us again on the agenda. Why we're here, it's about these three things. We're here because of the man. We're here because of the message. We're here because of the mandate. Who is the man, Jesus Christ? What is your conviction about his personality and purpose? Once these three factors are clear to you, you'll be unshakable. As you listen to this outstanding three series DVD, The Man, The Message, and The Mandate, your journey of life will become even more glorious. What you have to do now is to live for Jesus. You can't live for yourself anymore. If you truly love Jesus, then you must live for him. This DVD by Pastor Chris is available now. To order, please call the number now showing on your screen. Experience the liquid love of our Lord Jesus Christ flow in and through you. It's also available on the Pastor Chris Digital Library app on the Google Play Store and Apple Store. Many people long for success. They desire to do something with their lives, to make a difference in society, to become famous, or to become great. We all have the want to move from ordinary to extraordinary, to make the leap from good to great, to turn the seed of greatness that is in us into a fruitful field, and to fulfill the call of God upon our lives. From Reverend Dr. Chris Oyakilomi comes this new and riveting book, The Power of Your Mind. Do you want to do something extraordinary with your life? See, God has given you an excellent tool to use in your journey of greatness. It is called your mind. Learn how to walk in divine excellence through the power of a renewed mind. Get your copy of The Power of Your Mind today. This teaching is now available to edify, enlighten, and give you a clear rendering on what many have grappled with for a long time. Number one, why do people sin? Two reasons, for all sin, any sin, the two reasons. And you sin because of either one of them or both. Number two, when does God forgive? When does the Father forgive? 
And on what grounds can he forgive? Number three, what is the basis for justification? Justified? That means declared not guilty. How can a sinner be declared not guilty of the sin that he committed? Sin, forgiveness, and righteousness is now available just for you. An understanding of this message will give you a clearer picture into God's ways of dealing with his children. Sin, forgiveness, and righteousness. It is now available on DVD and on the Pastor Chris Digital Library app for Android and iOS devices. Download and take it wherever you go. God bless you. All right, great to have you back on the agenda. Time for us to set sail on today's discussion. Before I do so, just want to remind you that you can watch us on the go at www.loveworldplus.tv. Go to the Google Play or Apple Store or Windows Phone Store to download our app, Love World Plus. Now uh, we're looking at the 33rd um, ordinary session of the African Union that took place recently in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Many issues, many facts and sides to be looked at. But before I do so, I'd like to bring my guests in. I'm privileged to have two um, uh, pleasant gentlemen sitting with me. I have Tochuku Izukama here, uh, once more on agenda. Thank you very much, Tochuku, for coming in. And yes, uh, we have Dipo Oyewole as well. Great to have you on Thanks the show. All right, gentlemen, let's uh, look at the issues. Uh, talking about the uh, AU summit is just rounded off in Addis Ababa. Also saw a new chairman being installed uh, in, the like, in the person of um, uh, President uh, of the Republic of South Africa, talking about uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, takes uh, takes um, up as the at the helm of that institution. Uh, the, the theme uh, said, um, silencing the guns and um, really taking um, a look at conflict on the continent, which seems to have been on the rise. Ironically, uh, Africa, according to what uh, transpired during the meeting, Africa needs to actually begin to solve its own problems on its own. And uh, really, one question many ask is, um, the African Union doesn't really have a good track record in actually keeping its promises. But let me get your perspective, Dipo. What's your take on the whole issue? Okay, well, I believe that the African Union, uh, it's time for us to see them go in a different direction. I mean, like you said, the track record with keeping to their promises has been a bit shaky. Okay, so um, we, for me, we haven't really seen the benefits of the said union on the continent, which for me, I'm hoping that with the new chairperson, the person of President Ramaphosa, hoping to see him steer the union or the organization in a different direction, especially in terms of security, um, collective prosperity, amongst other issues. But I mean, it's something that we're looking forward to seeing how he chooses to steer that ship. Tochuku sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? For you know, the African Union. Yes, the African Union, um, it evolved from the organization of African unity. unity. And um, I think in the early days of organization of African unity, the preoccupation was uh, with uh, independence of African countries. Mm. And uh, that dovetailed into fighting the minority regimes in Africa, like in uh, uh, Rhodesia and South Africa. But after the, the, the end of appetite in South Africa, it seems that they kind of uh, got to a milestone. The, the, the ultimate problem of Africa, the number one uh, concern of African countries seem to have been taken care of, um, which was not necessarily correct. But they continue. I think that was when they metamorphosed into uh, AU. Uh, they have a lot of uh, um, um, issues cut out for them. But one thing they've been able to successfully do is to stand against military coups in Africa. 
Military coups are not popular anymore in Africa. And any country, wherever a coup takes place, all of uh, African Union comes against it, totally ostracizes the country, uh, the particular country. Uh, the country automatically becomes a parish. So I think they've done well in that area. But there are so many other issues to handle. But first of all, it's important that they deal with problems in their country. Most of these countries uh, have many problems. South Africa uh, have a, a, a crime, corruption, economic stagnation, and so on. And we have similar things in Nigeria. They've not been able to get their houses in order. Mm. And it will be hard to do anything collectively on the continental level. Talking about collectively, um, um, Sir Ramaphosa lined out um, his agenda for his tenure. One of those issues that he seeks to look at is um, the issue of um, deepening unity uh, of the continent. Uh, how feasible do you find this, um, Dipo? Okay, well, um, I can only be optimistic. Especially okay. when we have, when Africa looks like uh, Francophone versus Anglophone right now. Mm. Yeah, so that, that's, that's one of the issues and that's one of the challenges. And I think um, it is quite interesting that now that he's the chairperson of the African Union, he's making that statement. I mean, we remember a few weeks ago, I choose not to call it months ago, when yeah. we had a lot of issues with Nigerians in, within the borders in South Africa. Yeah. So we're hoping to see that um, he, they, he would hold true to his word. But that being said, I think, like uh, Tuchuku rightly said, that individually, as individual states, we need to do a lot better in terms of security, in terms of the economy, in terms of stamping out corruption on the continent. We need to do that on our individual basis. And I think that Nigeria, may I also say that Nigeria is also not really occupying her, her, her place on the mm. continent. We'll, we'll talk more about Nigeria. Um, <laughs> that is an issue we cannot sidestep. But yes. le let's look at you know what you've talked about. Um, um, talking about uh, bringing unity within the continent, mm. uh, work speaking with one voice. Yes. Africa can definitely do better as a block. Yes. But how do we uh, surmount these hurdles, uh, Tuchuku? Uh, Especially think... when many talk about the challenges of neocolonialism, you know, um, and besides those, act uh, according to um, President of Egypt, who stepped down, talking about those fighting proxy wars you know, on the continent? Uh, well, uh, there, no, nowhere do people speak with one voice. Uh, you can't even speak with one voice in your own house because you don't have No teenager agrees with his father completely. I disagree. In, yeah, in, in, in the, the Bible, Babel, people spoke with one voice. I don't know. <laughs> <Lord had to. laughs> okay. okay, but the thing is that you're looking for consensus. In the okay. U.S., for example, uh, you have the Republican Party with their concept of American... Uh, greatness and its role in the world and how to attain that, uh, uh, the unique position of America, how to hold on to it. The Democrats have the same feeling that America is the number one country and should retain the number one position, but has a slightly different approach to getting the same thing done. So what they have in America is consensus, not speaking with one voice. Uh, in our individual countries, we lack the same consensus. There's no consensus in Nigeria. Uh, so talking about consensus on a continental level, uh, to me, is almost impossible. We have to go back home and redefine the mm -hmm. objects of our nationhood. Nation. The problem of Nigeria was that it was set up by the colonial masters. It was just, just a, a, an exigency of British colonialism, OK? But how many years after colonialism, 60 years, we have not redefined the object of Nigerianhood. And we need to do that so as to be able to give Nigerians a unified sense of purpose. Mm. You don't unify Nigeria by uh, 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 not allowing us our, uh, uh, to express our ethnicity. We are different people already. But what is that that binds different people in one union? Why? And what is that unifying factor? We've not been able to find it. So I don't see it coming on a uh, continental on a, on a larger scale. Large scale. Well, interesting. Uh, let, let, um, we had um, one of our correspondents um, for in, in our South African studios, uh, Yvonne Kasande, uh, at the AU summit. And she had the privilege of actually uh, feeling firsthand what uh, the spirit you know, behind uh, the summit was like and um, had the privilege of speaking with some African leaders 
on the current challenges faced by the continent. I'd like to bring her in now. Yvonne, are you with us? Well, absolutely. A very good evening to you, Henry, and to your viewers. Good evening, Yvonne. Great to have you join us on the agenda. Uh, Yvonne, you were at the African uh, Summit, the 33rd, that is, and um, you had the privilege of actually, um, you know, feeling the pulse of some of these African leaders. Can you give us some of the highlights of the event? Well, that's very true. Um, I've actually just returned from Addis Ababa. And I was also privileged to be part of some of the uh, closed peace talks that they had, particularly with Ambassador Shmael Shegui. He was the one that was actually leading the whole peace talks at this um, AU summit. Well, as the agenda of it suggests, which is obviously silencing the guns in 2020, and fighting terrorism and creating a conducive environment for the development of Africa. It comes with a whole lot of mixed, uh, you know, emotions, questions, debate and doubt as to whether this is just another topic, a talk shop, or there's something in actual fact that can be measured in terms of the, you know, the, the, the action that will be taken that is tangible, that can be seen. Now, you speak about, with your guests there, I heard you talk about how other African countries are conflicted. This topic was about to, you know, talk about fighting conflict, um, genocide, possible genocides in some of the countries in Africa, wars, you know, famine and all that stuff. The most outstanding, though, obviously being the topic in terms of how they fight conflict was the fact that they had the peace uh, mission. Uh, the security mission that seemed to dominate the whole uh, uh, conference this time around, the whole summit. And in some of my questions, when I actually had an interview, a one-on-one -on -one with um, Ambassador Schmel, I asked him, I said, but we have been speaking about the same issues. It's 33 years of an African Union. In 33 years, if you look at it, in 2005, there was a report that stated that only seven countries in Africa were conflicted. In 2018, that number had literally tripled. We now had 21 countries that were in conflict, which means that whatever promises or whatever talks that were then you know, discussed at that time, uh, the years before in the summit, this actually went totally against it. So I asked him, I said, why is it that we are seeing an increase instead of a decline? Mm. Is it because it's mere ignorance? or nobody just really cares. Or maybe what we shouldn't forget is that, is there an underlying arm of agitators? Yeah. In his speech, in his opening speech, the newly elected AU chairperson, President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa, spoke yeah. about yeah. how Africa needed to be very careful of foreign countries that yeah. were actually uh, you know, funding proxy wars yeah. in Africa. Mm -hmm. So you would now get to see that while we are speaking about peace and prosperity in Africa, would it really be possible? Let me just give you examples of regions that are really troubled right now. We have the Sahel region, which is in complete chaos. Okay. We speak about Mozambique, which has become a bigger threat. In just this year alone of 2020, January into February, there have been 28 attacks, 400 people killed, more than 100,000 people displaced. How did this happen? Mo Mozambique was never really a country that faced terrorism. We take a look at uh, the Somali region. There has been an increase. Al-Shabaab has just not been able to be silenced. Meanwhile, there is a, 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 a force that they have actually created there in the Sahel region, which is the G5, the ones that are fighting Al-Shabaab, speaking about um, the terror in, in Mozambique that has also you know, come on the increase. Talking about post-election violence, which seems to be on the increase as well, every African country that goes for elections, they seem to go into some sort of a mode of protest and, you know, it now then escalates into something else serious, where we will now see lives lost. What is causing all this on the African continent is yeah, the question you, I ask. Your, your salient questions. Let me just tell you the response. Your salient questions you're asking, Yvonne. So in that light, what are your expectations for the new chairman? Do you think he will deliver, considering that uh, al-Sisi steps down and really, some say, was pushing the Arab agenda more than the African agenda? What's your take? 
I totally agree with you when you say LCC was pushing the Arab agenda. You would remember when LCC came into power, he promised to end terrorism. In fact, the reason why he was even chosen as chair of the AU was because he came up with a plan where he said he was the best candidate to end terrorism. What are we seeing right now in escalation? Now, you speak of President Cyril Ramaphosa. President Cyril Ramaphosa is more of a negotiator. He's more of a business person. Africa is on the rise of terror, of conflict. So would his skills actually be able to counter terrorism? I don't certainly think so. I don't actually think so. If you look at where he's coming from, his own country, he inherited a government, obviously, that was in turmoil. The turmoil has increased. While he's good at negotiating, you'll find that his strategy is more of like a diplomatic kind of approach. I don't think that is what Africa is looking for right now, a diplomatic approach. While, of course, we do not ignore the whole idea of... Uh, uh, you know, going on the table and negotiating and talking. Dialogue is always the best in many places. Dialogue is always the best because obviously it silences the gun. But would they really be able to silence the gun? Let me ask you why I ask this question. If you look at the past years when the terrorism was on the increase in Africa, there was a divide between the people that believed in Islam and the ones that didn't. Why? Because terrorism has been linked to um, you know, Islamic extremists. So now the Islamic people have actually come to defend it. The most interesting thing is that the, the, the Minister of International Relations in Africa, Naledi Pando, is an Islam herself. While she was at the AU summit, she was arguing the fact that, why are you blaming it on Islam? But these groups are all Islamic extremist groups, okay. terrorist groups. Talk about Boko Haram in Nigeria, where you are, where they now have to force uh, Christians to recant their faith. Mm. So you see, it's an ongoing cycle that has people that are in denial. At the same time, it's also being financed by an underlying arm, which is obviously, uh, you know, international countries that are funding the proxy wars. H what has happened to Libya? Libya is in total flames. I asked Ambassador Shmel Shigui a question. I said, what has the AU summit done ever since uh, General Muammar Gaddafi was assassinated? Mm -hmm. We all know how Muammar Gaddafi was assassinated, but what has been the stance of AU? How many years has it been since Gaddafi is gone? Right. What is the AU doing about the situation in Sudan? Very good Sudan questions. Sudan has asked Very for an extension. Questions. Very good questions you're asking. And uh, those questions I'd like to pose to my guest as well here in the studio because we, we do have, you know, a challenge on our hands. We've talked, uh, we need to ask questions. Does the theory of proxy wars uh, really exist? Uh, Dikpo, what's your what are your thoughts? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because for me, I think it is quite... Uh, shocking that we've had certain conflicts in different parts of the continent and for some reason they haven't been able to be stopped by the local authorities and uh, we wonder what is going on there's huge influx of arms and ammunitions that cannot just be accounted for by people on the ground and we're wondering what is happening somehow these people get some form of funding that seems to be unlimited they get unlimited access to vehicles um, trucks motorcycles access to food and all sorts of things they there's, need. There's to... been allegations of um, Turkey funding, you know, Boko Haram, you know, in, yes. in Nigeria yes, as well. Yes, there's, there's been those, those allegations there. So for me, I think it is something that we need to look at critically, both here at home and on other parts of the continent. Because see, for me, either it's a proxy war or it's an internal war or whatever way you choose to look at it, the fact remains that until there is peace and assured security, mm. we cannot be talking about prosperity. Okay, so I think that's something we need to address right now, which okay. the reason for the theme of this year's AU summit is quite instructive for me, and I think it's something that all African leaders you, you buy into. into you buy into that, right? Yes. All right. Let me come to Tochuku. Tochuku, what are your what's your position on this? Well, I will try to make a distinction between two types of conflicts in Africa. One is the Islamic fanaticism or fanatical inspired conflicts like you have in Mali, you have with Northern Nigeria, Boko Haram, parts of Chad and Cameroons. And then just political conflict, like you have in Sudan, like you have in Libya, and um, different parts of Africa. Yeah. Okay, 
the, 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 the Islamic fundamentalist conflict or inspired conflict are much, much more complex. They are spillover of the um, ongoing battle of, uh, yeah, of, of ideology or religion between the West and Muslim countries. It's spilled over into Africa, and that's much, much more difficult to deal with. But when it comes to political conflicts in Africa, I don't think there's any proxy war going on. I'm tired of Africans making excuses. We cause our own problems. When you say proxy, it gives the impression that we are helpless and innocent people being manipulated by foreign powers. Mm -hmm. We are killing ourselves at the instigation of foreign powers. That's not true. We have examples in Angola where two major groups, political groups, fought each other for power. But in fighting for power due to their ideological leanings, uh, they, they called on their sponsors, uh, uh, the, the MPA, they called on Russia and Cuba. Mm. Uh, UNITA, the Union of UNITA and FNL, they called on South Africa and America. But who we are fighting? Was it Russia and America? No, it was the Angolan political parties fighting each other. These guys came to help them. If they didn't start the fight, the Americans and Russia wouldn't have been there. So it wasn't a proxy war. In Libya, there's no proxy war. A man held power from 1969 to whenever he was overthrown. Each time you overstay in power, you lose touch with reality. It's very dangerous. Mugabe started very well, but it all fell apart. But there's the same thing with Gaddafi. So the I don't agree with you. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. Henry. All right, Yvonne, you, I'll, become, I'll definitely, you, you, you've been you, listening you, to the you, discussion. You don't, you don't have to. I'll, I'll be coming to you okay. and your position on yeah, that. So the people of Gaddafi removed Gaddafi, and because he's held power for too long, and different factions fought him. And after they, they defeated Gaddafi, they, they couldn't agree. The different factions started fighting each other. It was something that happened in Somalia. Okay. Seth Barry was removed in the 90s, but the factions that removed him couldn't agree. And up till today, there's no peace in Somalia. Somalia. It's no proxy war. In Southern Sudan, General uh, Colonel Garange was a charismatic figure who galvanized the people and united the people. But just before independence, he died. And it was not that unifying, that uh, central figure to hold the people together. And it broke up into factions. Now, different people will always support you because a fighter, anybody that is fighting goes looking for supporters. You'll get them. But it's no proxy Especially war. when there are stakes. When, when there are stakes, oil and the rest of them. So mm. there's no proxy war in Sudan. There's no proxy war in Libya. And there's no, very few proxy wars in Africa, except for the Islamic fundamentalist uh, uh, conflict. Agendas. That, that's more complex. Okay, I, I, I'll, t I'll go to Yvonne right now, who's standing by uh, in South Africa via, via uh, Skype. And they're talking about this issue, Yvonne. You talked about, we talked about the Islamic agenda playing out at the African Union. Do you think it's time for Christians as well to begin to actually push their agenda on the continent? Well, absolutely, yes. Um, you know, Christians play a very vital part. Remember, we are the body of, of Christ. We're the ones uh, responsible for the prosperity of peace. We need to preach the gospel. You can only imagine what kind of a wor world it would be if everybody received this gospel and practiced this gospel and lived this gospel. We have to be more vocal. We have to be aggressive about what we know and fight all these demons that have seem to take taken over the world. But I want to make a comment, though, yeah. uh, when it comes to the, the point of there are no proxy wars in Africa. I do agree to a very large extent that Africa needs to look inward. Mm -hmm. Inward in the sense that some of the wars that are going on are civil wars. But listen, let me tell you where I disagree. If you look at the countries that are conflicted, they are strategically positioned. Um, the geopolitics cannot be ignored. If you speak about Libya, Gaddafi had always been fighting America, which is why he wanted a one United States of Africa where America would come and trade oil in their own local currency or the gold dinner. You would know the gold dinner that he was mm -hmm. fighting for, for Africa. Mm -hmm. He was taken out. That was uh, the unfortunate, cruel foreign policy of America. If you look at even Sudan, Sudan has Saudi Arabia's hand in it. That cannot be ignored. They are very much interested in the oil. Listen, Africa is at a brink of breaking if we don't find 
uh, if we don't look inward. Because as we speak right now, Europe is completely broke. So right now there's a scramble for Africa and hence the proxy wars cannot be ignored. I do agree that we also need to change certain things ourselves. You know, the civil conflicts, which is what we saw in Rwanda, where we had the Houthis and the Tutsis, of which Paul Kagame did well in terms of silencing that. Right now you go to Rwanda, there's no Houthi, there's no Tutsi, they are all Rwandese. So maybe those are some of the approaches that we need to take. But the issue of proxy wars cannot be ignored. Let me just give you one quick example before I know you're running out of time. Egypt, um, which has actually been championing the peace negotiations in Libya. Egypt has been accused of actually supporting Colonel Haftar. Now, Turkey is also supporting its own people there. We also have Syria and Russia that are also supporting their own. What do you call that? Those are proxy wars. Why are they fighting it? Because of the oil, which is why Muhammad Gaddafi died. While African leaders need to realize that, they need to respect the process of democracy. Democracy which states that after you finish your term, you allow people to go to the ballot and vote for their next leader and not, ref you know, they, they cede power. They refuse to cede power. They refuse to leave their positions. Right now we've got a Ugandan president, Yoweri Museveni, who's extended his tenure. He's, he's, he's changed his age. He now wants to be president for life. <laughs> Likewise, President Mugabe, just like you said. So those are maybe some of the things that we need to look inward. But uh, we can't ignore the issue of proxy wars. I mean, this debate can go on and on and on, trust me. All the right. facts that are up there are very visible and cannot be ignored. All right, Yvonne, I really appreciate you joining us on today's edition of the show. I have to let you go. Uh, Yvonne Kasande is a journalist and senior correspondent, Lovewell Sat, Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, right now, Thank you. gentlemen, um, quite getting interesting and robust yeah. discussion as we look at it. And we cannot deny that we must look at the role of Nigeria on the continent. Uh, what role has it played? Uh, the nation known as the giant of Africa. Um, is it still being able to, you know, carry its weight, if I may put it that way? I will talk more about this. We'll go for a quick break. When we return, the agenda continues. Don't go away. Are you interested to know the importance of your words? How to activate the creative power in your words? How to say the right thing at the right time? Find out in this insightful masterpiece by Pastor Chris. Discover the principle of creation and recreation. If you're going to live the true life that God has given to you, you must line up with the Word of God. This is where the ministry of the Spirit of God is indispensable because it's the Spirit that actually knows the codes. Hear this. You can't just prophesy. So you're going to prophesy as He commands you. You need the code. God, I need the sound code. I need the sound code. Hallelujah. I need the sound code. Once you have the sound code and you give it, creation will respond to you. Glory to God. Tap into the wealth of divine principles and live in the future of your dreams as you learn the workable principle of sound code and the spirit. This message is now available on DVD in a two volumes and four part series. To place your order, kindly call the following numbers now showing on the screen, or you can visit www.ChristEmbassyOnlineStore.org or download through the Pastor Chris Digital Library app, available on Google Play Store and Apple iStore. You will be glad you did. Many people long for success. They desire to do something with their lives, to make a difference in society, to become famous or to become great. We all have the want to move from ordinary to extraordinary, to make the leap from good to great, to turn the seed of greatness that is in us into a fruitful field and to fulfill the call of God upon our lives. From Reverend Dr. Chris Oyakilomi comes this new and riveting book, The Power of Your Mind. 
Do you want to do something extraordinary with your life? See, God has given you an excellent tool to use in your journey of greatness. It is called your mind. Learn how to walk in divine excellence through the power of a renewed mind. Get your copy of The Power of Your Mind today. All right, great to have you back. You're still watching the agenda. And don't forget, you can watch us on the go at www.loveworldplus.tv or go to the Google Play Apple App Store to download our app, Love World Plus. Uh, we, we've been uh, discussing much of what happened at the just concluded 33rd ordinary session of the African Union Summit, which took place in Addis Ababa. Uh, African leaders uh, uh, actually unanimous in um, trying to tackle conflict on the co continent with the theme silencing the guns. But there, are, there were others, so many things to talk about on the sidelines of the summit. And um, new installed chairman uh, talking about president of uh, South Africa, Sir Ramaphosa, actually reeling out his agenda for his tenure. And one of those uh, issues that he looks to tackle is the issue of advancing inclusive economic growth and sustainable development, supporting integration, industrialization, and just pulling down the walls, you know, between African nations. A fallout, many says, of uh, the Berlin Conference when Europe sat down, decided to break Africa up into fragments, you know, and so that it would not have that um, power of, you know, of size, if I may put it that way. But gentlemen, uh, let's look at this from this perspective. The issue of the African continental free trade area is something on the front burner now. I think it's the next step that um, Africa wants to take. And President Cyril Ramaphosa, too, very keen on this, saying that it, he wants to see this concluded in the, in the shortest possible time. But countries like um, Nigeria uh, seem, don't seem to be ready for this. Uh, Dipo, what's your take? Okay, so for me, I think that Nigeria not being ready for this, for, it's a bit of an embarrassment because we keep touting the title of being the giant of Africa, but uh, we haven't really shown clear leadership in a lot of areas. Now, a lot of people have even said that Nigeria shouldn't even be part of the Africa Free Trade Agreements, Nigeria should have been, shouldn't have signed on as quickly as they did, which I think they still delayed. But for me, it goes to show that we have not really gotten a sense of responsibility of our position on the, on the continent. Because if we are indeed the giant of Africa and we are supposed to lead this continent, on some level, by virtue of pride of place, we should be able to say this is what should happen as much as the other African states would have their own input in it if we do have the true influence that we're touting to have. But unfortunately, that's not what we're seeing right now. And I think that the Africa Future Agreement is something that Nigeria should be the one leading and not be at the back throwing tantrums and saying that this is not what we want. If there are terms that we're not comfortable with, I believe that we have the pride of place okay. and the influence to say, you know what, this is what we want, this is how we should change, we can reach a compromise, we have a dialogue, mm. okay? That is the place Nigeria should be right now, but we're not seeing that. So Chiku, um, what's your position on this matter? Well, it's uh, like a dialogue, right? Uh, uh, that one. Dipo, rightly like pointed out, it's closely tied to the role of Nigeria in Africa. Uh, uh, Nigeria supposedly is the giant of Africa. Uh, we tried to, we used to be, but then we started this floundering, blundering, bumbling uh, uh, stuff. We, we can't get ourselves together. So we lost our position as the giant of Africa. So we don't take the lead anymore, mm -hmm. politically, and economically, but it's not surprising that we cannot lead anymore because if we are the giant of Africa, we'd have, we'd have been the manufacturing hub of Africa, exactly. the leading economy of Africa. Mm -hmm. So other African countries have been afraid of Nigerians coming here to, to export their goods and dominate us and, uh, uh, and um, compete with us. You see, Afro other Africans would have been afraid of Nigeria. But Nigeria has really nothing, economically, we've done so badly. As a manufacturing country, we are not doing well. So we are the ones afraid of other African countries. Mm. Secondly, many uh, investors want to come to places like Ghana, where it's easier to do business, where the system is less corrupt, the people are more receptive to, 
new mm -hmm. ideas. And Nigeria is afraid that if they come to these countries and invest, they will just be dumping their goods in Nigeria. Uh, in Togo, for example, is it Bene? Where a lot of the Banese import a lot of used cars. Used cars and yeah. the used cars are taken to Nigeria. Mm. It's much easier to do business in, is it Bene? Bene or Republic. Bene Republic, Republic. Yes than Nigeria. So they import these cars, but the destination is Nigeria. Nigeria. So there'll be a lot of manufacturing going on around Africa, whereas the destination of the products will be Nigeria. That's what Nigeria is afraid well, of. Well, but it's a failure mm -hmm. on the part of Nigeria. We is it a failure on the part of Nigeria? What are stakeholders saying? Is this just our position? Well, I actually uh, came in touch with some analysts, and they had this to share, bearing their minds on Nigeria's activities on the continent. Let's take these sound bites and we will be right back to wrap it up. The activist role for which Nigeria's foreign policy is often associated is not the case at the moment. Even though there are areas that we can celebrate, for instance, uh, Nigeria is being celebrated at most international fora for its uh, war against corruption that thumbs up for the administration in spite of what we feel at home but beyond that i think the foreign policy of a country like nigeria should be much more proactive should be what has been described in literature as an activist you know role within the international political system as it is under Buhari, it's, it's not been stellar, it's been a lot timid. Uh, I would not say that we have lost our clouds, but the, the point is that um, we could do more. As I mentioned there, okay, if we were to treat the African Union like a United Nations, Nigeria will have a permanent seat. It means we will have veto power. In that kind of organization, our voice should not be muted. That should be our platform to shine, you know. Um, but I did mention that um, the government is constrained. I mean, when you have the kind of ec unhealthy economy that the government inherited, you can understand, you know, why it is not been an activist. It's not that an activist um, has been very conservative. We have Boko Haram to deal with. You have a poor economy and all that. So in a way. Um, I would say that has mediated the government's action. However, that does not take away from the fact that um, we should have a voice. This is Africa. This is our turf. If we do not shine here, you know, uh, where else? talking about shining uh, we need to draw the curtains at this juncture i really feel at loss with so much to talk about and deeper are raring to go and uh, tochuku as well but gentlemen we will make this a date some of the time but if, in your final words deeper you want to um, take us home on this matter yes i think it, the time has come for nigeria to show true leadership on the continent in every area Okay, because I think we've gotten to a place where we should have actual foreign policies that impact on African nations. Do we have such? We do not. We talk about trade agreements. We like to celebrate the ones with, the, with people in the West. We don't celebrate the ones we have with people on the continent. Do we even have any? I am not sure. All right. Uh, to well, 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 in the past, Nigeria did very well. Uh, and we had a very robust economy. The Naira was, uh, one Naira was $1.5 uh, dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, during the war of appetite, we helped a lot. We led Africa, except yes. the, And for ECOWAS or Bassanjo had gone there and demanded Nigeria should have a veto power. Mm -hmm. But I think the quality of our leaders fell dramatically over the years. Mm -hmm. With the good luck, Jonathan's Buhari, things are not what it should be. Things are getting worse. But I think with the right leader, Leadership will get back there. All right, optimis optimism there coming from my guest. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dikpo uh, coming on the show. Exactly, uh, Dikpo Oyewole, great to have you. It's been a you know, robust discussion, and as well as Tochuku Izukama, it's, it's been fun fantastic with you guys. Thank I want to thank uh, Yvonne as well for joining us from South Africa, uh, bringing her, uh, you know, um, 
uh, her thoughts to bear on this discussion. Uh, we will always uh, definitely talk about Africa. Join us on the agenda same time next week. My name remains Henry Williams. And remember, I leave you with these words that only Africans can build Africa. I will leave you with something to think about. A soundbite from Obi Ezekwesili, doctor that is former minister in Nigeria, talking about the challenge of lead leadership on the continent. Until then, stay blessed and see you next time. Bye-bye. So we are talking about a pool of people. You said 12 million do enter the labor market every year. I need you to know that only 10% of the 12 million would find anything that is defined as decent jobs, according to ILO. Now, if only 10% would find those jobs, and we've got this 90% that are on the margins of society, that is the issue of governance for us. We must look at the, the failure of governance to actually in, in, have the right kinds of policies that lead to growth. The growth that is diversified, the growth that is inclusive. And at the heart of this, is what kind of education system, what kind of skills are we emphasizing, what kind of economic opportunities. Issue on the African scene, the politics of succession in Africa, the crisis of stability and power. How, how critical is this? Police arrested for 12 people for the violence in Johannesburg, while eight others were arrested.